accepted the enrolment of certain letters patent of confirmation of our predecessor, Elizabeth, late Queen of England, bearing date in the 27th year of her reign, made and granted to the men and tenants of the manor of Corby, and remaining on record in our court of chancery of these words.
In 1947, as an 11-year-old boy, I came from a family of nine. You were just another child, and everything was limited. You had pass-me-down clothes. You, you never ever, your dad mended your shoes. You never went to a hairdresser. He cut your hair, and there was very little to do, and loads and loads of children in the street. And there wasn't a lot of money about. We had Russian books for everything. And the thought of a fair coming up was such exciting. I can remember as a little girl living in the village, our next door neighbours were quite a few men in the family and they all played in the silver band. The main excitement of the 1947 pole fair was the change from a simple basic life to colour and excitement and music. Uh, it was unbelievable. This is Movie Tone. Lionel Gamlin reporting. The main tradition of the pole fair is the charter reading. And also, the oldest person who were born in the village would be carried round the village in a chair. Clergy, so whoever was in St John's Church, was carried. The toll was a way to raise funds to, to fund the pole fair every year. They put a gate up at the, all the entrances to the village. It was so exciting, everyone was all excited about it and the swing boats and roundabouts and pony rides. Oh, we've never seen anything like it. It was marvellous. Now, to prevent the people being picked up and put on a stang, the they put the tickets in the hats because you didn't want to be picked up and put on a stang and then run to where the stocks were and be bounced about <laughs> on that stang. My gran was taken off by some gentleman to put in the stocks and as an eight year old, I was running along the street crying my eyes out, bring my gran back. And my dad rescued me, and he paid them a toll money to let granny go free. You, when you sat in the stocks, you had to pay a penny to get out the stocks, and there was a, a donation box that was screwed onto the stocks. In 1947, my sister and I was walking down the high street. I was in the brownies, I was 10 years old. Thelma was 11. <laughs> Loads of people everywhere. We just went round the corner to the nook. And as we went up the nook, where we was, the brownies were meeting, uh, my sister Thelma ran off, because there were two men chasing a man, and she ran off behind them up the nook. The grassy mound, people don't seem to realise, was a public airway shelter. You had entrances on one end and on the other end, and then it was covered in mud. It was for all the people that lived around the park. We stopped at the top of the Jorm and watched the Morris dancers. They belonged to Corby Village. Uh, Mr Bradley used to run them. I'm sure that was his name.
Fancy dress in 1947 was everything to me as a little boy. Four of our family entered it, but Dennis, my younger brother, had the pearly king outfit. And the thing that caught people's eyes was it wasn't pearls on his sackcloth, it was beer bottle caps. And my dad punched two holes in each one and my sister sewed them on and they were on his clothes and his hat and it caught the public's imagination like nothing on earth. As a wandering minstrel, I was dressed up in colour and we only had plain clothes every other day of our life. So I had this top hat, silver, I had a banjo to hold, though I couldn't play it, didn't know anything about it, and a red jacket, and, and felt special, really special. And so did everybody else look special. It was like magic, and it never happened before that. So it was the start of something lifting us out of our very plain lives. Penny Farthing Bike, his name was Willie Keeley. He used to drive trains for a living. And he also went to all the weddings in the church as a good luck symbol because he was a chimney sweep. Well, in 1962, I cycled down to the pool fair. I was 11, so the lady across the road from us was our headmistress and she was also my teacher. So she was speaking to my mother and said, I'll take Denise down, she can hear the bells and we'll walk the bounds. The bell ringing is part of the ceremony to start it because Corby Village used to be in the middle of the very thick Rockingham Forest and it was to call in all the workers deep in the forest to get them in for the start of the thing. So, and to wake everybody up because it didn't have alarm clocks. In 1962, whole fair, we decided, the women from the village, we would have a tug-of-war team. So we got one up, myself and three of my sisters was in it. We had a man called Reg Guttridge, was the referee, and a Mr Stratton from the village. We won it anyway. We won a barrel of beer, but we had to pull hard. One of the things I remember clearly is that I recognised some of the guys that were turning the ox because uh, they were our dustmen. After the tug of war, we went down to John to the hog roast, and we all had one. Good fun, loads of people around, all laughing and joking. Then we went into the cardigan and had a drink. The men drunk all our beer, thought we'd won a barrel of beer. <laughs> and then there's the greasy pole, where a ham is, is put at the top of the greasy pole and it really is greased, really, really greased. And uh, the person who gets up the top of the pole is the person that receives the ham from the top. In 1962, I remember the pole queen was a hairdresser for stuff for shops, and my mum used to get her head on it, so we knew her. And the driver of that fire engine was the leading fireman, Tom Good. Tom Good was the longest serving fireman at Corby. Uh, I've actually got a picture of him with the, with the old brass helmets on. Mm -hmm. 
1962 Pearl Fair, my sister worked for the council and she borrowed a small lorry off them and we dressed all the children up as nursery rhyme figures, all the grandchildren and my children included and my sis older sister went on the float with them. She was dressed up as old Mother Hubbard. younger sister Kitty had a motorbike and she did it up as a horse and she rode it round all the way around the parade. Proud as could be. It was noisy. Uh, you knew people on the, on the lorries as they went past, you could see someone you knew. It was a major part of the, the thing for the afternoon. In 1982, we mustn't forget that it was only a few years after the closure of the steelworks and the blast furnaces, and it made 13,000 people redundant. Those that hadn't gone back to Scotland to live were stuck here, and the unemployment was very high. The, the ox was donated by Morris the Butcher, who had a butcher shop in the village on the same side as the cardigan. On the Friday, when the ox arrives, the locals from the village, locally born, they go and mount the ox on a big pole above where they're going to roast it. And somebody has to stand there all night to put pallets, wooden pallets on, and to create the flames and the heat, and they roast it all night evenly. And then in the, the next day, on pole fair day, somebody will bid to have the first slice off the oxen. So there was a lot of poverty in Corby, serious poverty. And I wished to make my daughter a dress. She was three years old, so I made her a 15th century outfit, clothes, with part curtain, part tablecloth, and I walked round the parade with her. Everyone was so, so excited, but it was a hard time for lots and lots of people during that time. It was a jolly good day. In 1982, one of my sons, of his own accord, built a Viking boat in our garden with his two brothers and they assembled this boat with a sail and a crow pattern on the sail uh, and they gathered their friends and girlfriends and assembled this boat which they walked in, they held inside with straps round the neck and the girls behind on a rope like slaves. It was his invention and he made it happen and he won first prize. Corby, we consider Stephen's Sun Fair to be our fun fair because ever since I was a girl, they're the ones that have come. Stuart's and Lloyd's, as the steelworks was then, used to have a fun day and Stephen's came along and if your father worked in the steelworks, you got free tickets to go on the ride, which was pretty good. And they've been coming every year since. I believe they still do come. 1982 Pearl Fair, they had a huge market on the charter field and there were lots of souvenirs and things in there, lots of pottery things that they'd made, cups and mugs. They were pretty plain, the first ones, heavy pottery like earthenware.
It was a jolly good day, lots of entertainment and excitement all day long. It was a really good pole fair. The most important tradition of the town and of the pole fair is the reading of the charter, which is read by the re rector at uh, St John's Church. Greeting. We have inspected the enrolment of certain letters patent of confirmation of our predecessor, Elizabeth, late Queen of England, bearing date in the 27th year of her reign, made and granted to the men and tenants of the manor of Corby, and remaining on record in our court of chancery of these words. Whereas, according to the custom hitherto obtained and used in our Kingdom of England, the men and tenants of ancient domain of the Crown of England are and ought to be quit of toll, panage, murage and passage throughout the whole Kingdom of England. Murage is surrounding areas that surround the village, as it were, except that we didn't have any surrounding walls or anything because we were in the middle of a forest. And Panage is because Corby Village then was a little tiny village in the middle of Rockingham Forest. And Rockingham Forest was an, an oak forest which produced acorns. And the pigs and other animals of the people who lived in the village were allowed to come into the, into the forest and eat all the acorns. Being the mayor in 2002 of Corby was one of the greatest days of my life. And I was a mayor in 2001. But because I was the first mayor to have been born and bred in Corby Village, they allowed me to stay on till the end of May so that I could be the mayor for the poll fair. from the domain of Corby. We are proud to present before his royal personage the reenactment of the granting of the charter to Corby that she celebrated this day in Paul Fair. Let's get this straight here, right? It's lovely. It brought you to my eyes. Right. The Queen of England is stuck in a forest in the mud, right? And she says to you, right, lead me to a place of safety. She says, lead me to a place of safety. And you brought her to Corby, right? <laughs> Are you a complete tuna nutter or what? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Have a lovely afternoon. It doesn't matter who you are, so. We thank you, good people all. Good people of Corby, we give thanks. Now, Sir Christopher. <laughs> Good men and tenants of the ancient village of Corby, Her Most Gracious Majesty remembers the help and succour you gave to her in Rockingham Forest and is thankful. You have served Her Majesty and country 
well and true. And by this token, Her Majesty is sure that you will always be true to her and England, her blessed realm. In recognition of your aid, Her Majesty does today bestow on you this, her royal charter, to hold a fair each May Day, or thereof each score year, and be free to do so as long as the good village of Corby shall endure. I do think that you measure your life by the events you've attended and then the bits in between slip around but you remember that event and then maybe something happened in between and then there's another event and the poll fairs have done that for me. 1962 when I was 11 I thought 20 years I'll be so old I'll be so old that I can remember really clearly thinking it so I've now attended three in 1962 I went there as a child in 1982, I went there with my children. In 2002, I went there with my grandchildren. I would like very much to, for it to stay something medieval and old that people can say, yes, I remember that one because it's not just a straight fair or a Highland gathering or things like that. And I want to maintain those traditions because I think it will stand out in the years to come as something that is unusual and very, very relevant. <laughs> In the procession was uh, a horse-drawn bus and when it got to the junction of Station Road and Cottingham Road, the horses tried to pull it over the bridge. Well, the, too many people on the bus and the horses couldn't get over the bridge. So a crowd of people had to get off the bus and walk over the bridge and it managed to get over the bridge then. hopes for the future of the Pole Fair that it, it captures the imagination of all these new people that keep coming into Corby because this is real Corby. The Pole Fair was a reflection of what we are, our history, how deep it is and how important it is to our town. I am part of the organising committee this time. And we're very, very passionate that we want to maintain the old traditions. Yes, you have to include some new things. Yes, you have to look to the future. But I don't want any of the old traditions to be lost. I want the, the greasy pole to be there, the stocks to be there, uh, the bells ringing, the people walking the bounds. Now, if I make it to the 2042 one, I will be 91. And I hope I'll be coming along, and I hope I'll be coming along with my great-great-grandchildren. Because to me that is a very important part of the fact that it only comes over every 20 years. You think that's just too long, and why don't they do it? It's a marker. You can remember things. You can measure your life in things like that, and I'm measuring my life in it, and I'm loving it. So I hope all the new people that come to live in Corby all understand it's part of Corby's tradition and support it.